Hello, and welcome to another Industry Careers for PhDs podcast brought to you by Cheeky Scientist. I'm your host, Isaiah Henkel, and today we will be talking with Julie De La Cruz a publication about publication specialist careers. If you're interested in getting access to the full interview and access to all of our job search materials and our private uh, job referral network, uh, go to cheekyscientist.com backslash association and learn how to become an associate. Uh, you can get these podcasts, which are our interview highlights, delivered to your inbox for free by going to cheekyscientist.com and email subscribing on our homepage. And finally, you can listen to all of these podcasts on iTunes at any time uh, for free, of course. So again, we're going to be talking with Julie De La Cruz about publication specialist careers. Julie received her bachelor's degree in psych biology with a minor in classical civilization from UCLA. She then went on to get a master's in psychology at New York University and a PhD in psychology at City University of New York Graduate Center. She received her second PhD in neuroscience in 2014 at Maastricht University in Holland. Um, and she was a postdoctoral fellow at UC Irvine until 2005 when she successfully transitioned uh, in industry as a publications specialist uh, in facial aesthetics and plastics at Allergan in Irvine, California. So we're going to jump right in with Julie now. So yeah. welcome officially, Julie. Great to have you. Thank you. Yeah, sorry everyone about the internet thing. It worked perfectly last week. So. All right, it happens. It's, it's uh, technology's fun. So yeah, I know we have a lot of questions here, and I I, I was looking forward to this webinar myself because uh, you know to hear something like publication specialist, publication manager, uh, you know this is something that that might seem relevant to a you know a scientific publishing company like if you work for nature um, but you're you know you're working for a a scientific company um that has right. a, a variety of pursuits and initiatives and is doing hard science um so i want to jump in in and, and we'll rewind a little bit but i want to jump in and maybe just have you explain what a publication specialist and a publication manager is um and what where these roles uh do for a company like allergan okay so I like to make the joke that um, what a publication manager does is everything a PhD student does without the research or the writing. But <laughs> besides mm. that, um, <clears throat> what I really do is I take the uh, preclinical, clinical, and post-market data, and we, we put this data into, like, abstracts and manuscripts, and we make sure it gets to the right um, conferences with the right audience and also the right peer-reviewed journals. And it also takes a lot of strategy because you want to time these things at the same time with like either with certain products that your competitors are bringing out or if it's uh, going at the same time uh, as a launch of a product. And yeah, so right now I work on um, Botox cosmetic, Givoderm fillers, and breast implants. But it's completely different than what my PhD was, is basically dopamine and neuroscience. So that mm. was a complete 180 right there. So I'm going to jump back in a second, but uh, real quick, can you speak up uh, into the phone a little bit? I don't know if it might mean just holding it closer to your mouth or whatever. We're just having a couple of people that are having trouble to hear. Um, here. Okay, how's this? That's great. We did okay. it. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, okay I just so brought it closer to my mouth. And so, what did you? So, what would you say you do on a day-to-day -day basis uh, in, in this role? It really depends. Um, a lot of the time, I I have a lot of meetings because I work with a cross-functional team. Um, I meet with a lot of um, clinical people, med affairs, regulatory, marketing, and I, I get together and put this strategy, um, and um, if once a month, I put together a publication planning team where everybody comes together and we see how our deliverables are for that month and if we're on track with everything we've planned. And once a year, we get everybody from around the world together um, and we plan for the next year. So that last July, we planned for 2017. And some days I'm 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 at work early mm. because I have to meet with London, and some days I'm at work late because I have to meet with Singapore. Um, this is really a global uh, job. Mm. I like some of these comparisons you're making. Uh, you know, it's 
it has to do with publications, but it sounds very similar to what a any kind of project manager or product manager would be doing. Uh, you're doing a lot of cross-functional work, a lot of coordination. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, it, I thought I, I like to think of it as many projects manager. As hmm. well. <laughs> many projects manager. Maybe they'll take. Maybe they'll t start using that title instead. Uh, yeah. But yeah, you're exactly right. So it's not just projects; it's many projects. And publications, in a sense, are products, right? They are projects. And so I think this is yeah. one area where a lot of you are like, well, what is a publication specialist? What does this have to do? Uh, this is where digging in and really learning about the different titles of companies, and, and especially how these titles might be the same uh, or very similar, right? Like you just said, project manager, product manager, uh, many projects manager um, are important. Yeah. And I think it's also crucial to, to note that publications are important in industry. And if you really want to get, you know, you want to stay close to public publication work or certainly writing work that you can work for a large scientific company in these areas. Uh, and I don't think a lot of PhDs uh, recognize that. Yeah, so I wanna, yeah, exactly. Right. And so I want to back up a little bit now that we understand, you know, what this title, publication specialist, publications manager now is um, for you. Maybe we can write a little bit and, and you can tell us a little bit about your story about what your transition into industry and starting with specifically a question we like to ask a lot why did you want to leave academia uh, well that's an easy question for everybody here right um the reason i wanted to leave academia well besides being paid very little <laughs> um i wasn't <laughs> happy i was not happy doing science every day i was I, you know, I, I did two PhDs and a postdoc, so I, I was doing bench work for at least 10 years. Mm. And I, w I was tired of it, and I was ready to move on and ready to grow and move to a different position. And, um, yeah, so I, I joined Cheeky Scientist, and um, it helped me realize at first I thought I wanted to be an MSL, which mm. is, is still a very good job, but it's really hard to get. So I, I expanded my um, – my choices, and I was also thinking communications, maybe field application scientist, and um, so I put on my resume, um, I, I would like to work in science communications, but not writing because I'm a horrible writer. Um, that's one thing everybody thinks I do, and I really don't. I mm. tell the writers what to write, but I don't write myself. So mm. that's a whole different. That's a whole different story. That's a medical writer. So, yeah. um, well, and just to jump in, I think that answers Goldie's question too. Uh, Goldie yeah. asked, "What type? What type of deliverables? Um, writing well, the are, deliverables, is the deliverables would, right? Yeah, the deliverable. That's a term we like to use. You, you'll get if you once you enter industry, you get to use all these fun new lingo that you've never used before. But mm -hmm. so deliverables would then be the end, like turning in, submitting the abstract, submitting the poster, or submitting the publication to get it published. So those." Three are basically the three deliverables of the publication manager. Yes. Exactly. So those are the products that we produce. Right. So you did, so you didn't like writing. You wanted to get out of academia, but you you know you started to expand your job search, which is great. I just want to jump in real quick because for a lot of you, maybe you've been targeting that one perfect position, uh, and, and you haven't seen any progress. Start looking for lateral positions or other types of industry positions um, to get into, uh, like Julie did. So so you started looking around, and, and then what happened? It was actually um, a recruiter contacted me. <laughs> because I put on my resume, I put it on the career builder or whatever. The recruiter contacted me and he said, Hey, do you want to do a pub position? Um, I don't even know what that is. I remember I, I put that, I, I put that out in the cheeky scientist association. I was like, help. I don't know what this job is. <laughs> so, That's right. so uh, thanks everyone for helping me out on that. Um, and it actually helped um, on my interview that I didn't know what the job was. So that made me, I was interviewing them as well. Like, do I want to do this job? So I, I actually asked a lot of questions, which, which helped a hour interview lead to a, end up being a two hour interview. So, wow. Well, let's, so, let's, let's back up real quick because you touched on some important points here that I think many of the people listening don't have experience with yet. So number one, you know, this really highlights the importance of keywords like we talked about. If, you know, when you're doing your LinkedIn profile or if you are going to post a resume, you know, having the right keywords on your resume, that's the only way that recruiters can find you, really is, other than the, obviously word of mouth once you get the ball rolling. Um, so this was, it, it, this just shows how having the right keyword ha got Julie contacted. Now, when the recruiter did contact you, can we just break down kind of at a micro level what that interaction looked like, how they reached out, how you followed what you what you said, how you followed up, and how they handed you off to the hiring manager? Um, yeah, usually when I, I I did post my 
my uh, job on career career builder, which you shouldn't do alone. You should obviously do also networking and you should talk to people. And it's just one additional thing you should maybe could do. Sure. Um, usually the emails for the things recruiters give me were like um, sanitation worker, secretary. One time I got <laughs> senior regulatory affairs. I'm like, well, that's getting close. That's a close one. But this one was just lucky. Um, he, he, yeah, he emailed me and says, Hey, do you want to be a publication specialist? And, so it was back and forth. I'm like, I don't know what this is. And he's like, mm. and Allergan was uh, 10 minutes away from where I work. So I thought, yeah, you know what, let's, let's give it a shot. And um, this is the power of networking too, because I met um, an MSL who worked in that department and I asked him what he thought about it. And um, I was being interviewed by two people he knew. So I got some intel on, on the, my, two bosses basically. And I knew this going into my interview. Um, so, um, the recruiter set up the interview and I went to my interview, which I told you was a one hour scheduled interview, two hours long. Mm. And, um, 30 minutes later, I, I actually had a really fun interview. I said, I said to my husband, I, I, I know I might not get this job, but, uh, I, I would love to have all my interviews like this because it was fun. It was just really fun. Um, and then mm. 30 minutes later, I got a call saying I got the job. Okay, great. Yeah, so, I mean, I think this is very similar to the the, the kind of uh, interview workflows that we see. And, you know, uh, like Julie said, she may have struck gold with posting her, her resume. That's that's. Uh, excellent, um, but you, you need, this needs to be a part of your larger job search strategy that includes networking and getting referrals. Um, in terms of once you got the call and you got put in contact with the hiring manager, how did you prepare for the interview? Did you look up other people that worked there? You said you had no idea what a publication specialist was. How did you know and, and determine that it was a role that you wanted to do or that you'd be okay doing you know, in, in the short term at the start of your industry career? Um, yeah, so that's what I said. I called someone that worked in the department and I asked him about it. So he told me what he knew. And right. then I did a lot of Google searching. Mm. Um, but um, a lot of it wasn't fully clear. So that helped me in the interview because I wanted to clear up what the position was. Yeah, that's what I mean. So like, what, what kind of questions did you ask that helped clear this up? Um, well, first I asked how much writing will I have to do? <laughs> because if they said a lot, then I would have like, nope, no, thank yeah. you. Um, what else? Um, I asked about how much we need to know about um, our competitors, and uh, my my first boss said, like, yeah, you'll you'll have to do some competitive intelligence. And this is the part where I also made a joke, and I said, like, competitive intelligence, does that mean I have to go in as a spy and, like, get out information? <laughs> he just laughs because, no, you just find out, like, through press releases and stuff. But it, it lightened up the mood, too. Mm. Um, yeah, we've heard that before, and I know some of you, you know, you might be like, oh, okay, that's never going to happen for me. But showing that kind of personality and social sense, emotional intelligence, you know, whatever you want to call it, uh, it's very valuable. Uh, you know, realize that most – time when you're interviewing, this person's going to have seen several PhDs before you and is going to be looking for some kind of well-roundedness and some personality. So I think that's important because you have to, I mean, personality and these kind of transferable skills are critical when you're working with teams of people. And that kind of takes me to my yeah. next question, Julie. So you, you know, how are things different now from when you were in academia? So you have a team now, is there a lot more teamwork, less teamwork, more meetings, uh, maybe kind of compare <laughs> a lot, and contrast? A lot. Well, first, no bench work. Unless right. my PI from my postdoc makes me go back and I have to do sometimes some, some work. But that's not my job. Right. Um, uh, there are a lot of meetings. Um, and it's, it's much more relaxed. The, the environment, I don't know how it is in, in all pharmaceutical companies, but the environment in Allegan is very relaxed and, and friendly and everybody's cooperative. Uh, if you don't know the answer to a question, you don't have to figure it out yourself. You can ask somebody else, somebody who's actually more knowledgeable than you trying to figure it out on yourself. That actually makes it more efficient. Mm. Um, and I, I mean, I love my job and I was so, miserable as a postdoc. So what are some of <laughs> That's a pretty good, that's pretty uh, cut and dry compare and contrast. What, what are some of the things that, 
you've you've had to learn that you've noticed yourself learning as, as you're in industry especially with working with teams of people I mean you know f for example when I when I first started having people report to me or teams like you you learn pretty quickly that you don't always have any sort of leverage right you can't say do this or else you have to really be able to move people or influence people without you know being able to fire them for example so yeah. what kind of things have you have you learned along those lines that have helped you you know manage people or get things done as a team better well I know that um, there's some things you just can't learn automatically you have to learn with experience so in the beginning I was frustrated because I didn't know anything but just as long as you, you just take your experience and you learn from it, then you can just use that. And another thing is you, you make good relationships with people so that when you're asking them to do something, you don't tell them to do something. It's, it's more, can you please do this by this date? <laughs> or mm. just a friendly reminder, this mm. is due soon. Mm. So I've learned how to make more of a politically correct language in my email. <laughs> yeah, like to gently prod people um, without triggering, yeah. triggering any sort of ego defense system, yeah. right? Exactly. And I think and that's important. And it also relationships. Yeah. That, that also helps. And the reason I'm digging into this is because, uh, you know, many of you have asked about these topics, uh, you know, what in terms of, you know, especially getting in, trying to get into management level positions. Um, I mean, this is a topic that we're hitting kind of hard right now because we, we have our, our new scientist MBA program that's opening up, which Julie just got in to. <laughs> um, yeah, like and, but you know, it's important. Like, how do you, <laughs> how do you get people to, to do stuff? How do you manage teams? Like you get into a management role. Now you're, you know, you're, you're in a management role now, Julie. So you, you've been successful in this and the little subtle things like how to talk to people by email is important. Uh, most of us as PhDs were, we're very uh, meticulous and we're also, you know, we're very cut and dry. Like this needs to be done. You said you would do this now. Why isn't it done? If you email somebody like that, uh, when you have no authority over them, the chances Ooh, of them working together is not good, right? That does not sound friendly at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I so mean, if you, you, you work with actual people. So just treat people how you would like to be treated, basically. Right. And even if you have authority over people, nobody, um, wants to be approached in that way, right? And it depends. I mean, sometimes you, you have to give people a kick in the pants and sometimes you have to, um, you know, talk to them as if almost like they have authority over you when they don't. And so I think these kind of subtle things, they, they are important. Um, so what I always like to ask this question and uh, I'm going off script a little bit here, but so in your interaction so far, you know, you've been in industry for, uh, it's been over a year now, right? A little bit over yeah, a year. A year. Yeah. Um, or almost exactly, yeah. So what, what are some of the things you've learned um, in terms of what works well and what does not work well? Like have you seen any disasters? You say overall the culture seems to be very good um, there and you love it. Um, why do you think the culture works so well? Any specifics that you could give the people listening? Well, I mean, one good thing about both my bosses besides having awesome, an awesome interview is the difference between having a PI – and he's telling you what to do and he's making threats. Like I remember I, I was working on a project um, while I was in Allegan and I said, I can't do it until after this weekend. He said, please make sure you do your best in order to maintain authorship. That was a threat. So oh. one thing I learned, <laughs> I learned from here, my, my supervisors don't treat me like that. They treat me like a person. They want to be a leader and lead by example. They said mm. they'd rather I make a mistake and and learn from it as opposed to being afraid of making mistakes. Mm. So they they have good leadership um, leadership skills that they pass on to me, and that, that's what I learn is that um, you know you have to just treat people like a leader instead. You have to be the leader instead of a boss. Mm. No, I, I love that. Exam. You should actually write that down. That's really good. <laughs> you have to be a leader instead of a boss. That was great. Like you feel like if you don't do something, something bad's going to happen, right? And so this it's a little bit different. I think we we often in academia we get trained to think that this is how we need to motivate other groups. Um, and certainly uh, for me, when I first went into to industry, I thought it was that way too. You know, you get a couple people that are working under you or even aside of you, and you're like, well, you said you're going to do this, and you want to. And they don't come through, so you you want to threaten them, or you want to jump the chain of command and go to a higher level boss. Um, but really, there are other ways to influence people, right? Um, 
than by yeah, these trends. exactly. So I think that's important. And yet you have this experience now, so it's it's good that we're sharing it. So if you do want to move towards, you know, talking about some of the skill sets that people need in this position, and we've really been hitting on, uh, you know, through the the last few webinars in this series, talking about people who are in these cross-functional positions. And again, that just means working with lots of different departments, lots of different teams. So maybe you can talk about what kind of skills um, make somebody thrive in this position. Like, what are the skills that you have that you, that make you, besides obviously what we've talked about already, that you you know, leadership skills, you treat people like they want to be treated. What other skills can PhDs develop while they're still in academia that would make them a good fit for this position that they might be able to mention during an interview too? One good thing about being a PhD uh, is that you can you can organize your data, you can organize all the projects you're in charge of. That has helped me a lot here is my organization skills. And that was one of the things I stressed upon during my interview is that for me, I was able to organize two different PhDs at the same time, so mm. I can do something here because it's in the same place. Mm. So, so it's organization skills, and then also communication. Um, I showed in my resume that I have I've taken a few communication courses, and since this is very outward facing towards the rest of the people of the company, I can communicate well, and I can show that um, I can disseminate information very well. Mm. And um, if you want specifically a publication job, you can show also how many papers you've published and how many uh, abstracts uh, you've submitted and posters you've presented because that's something that you're going to have to do in publications as well. Not do really your work, but you will do other people's work. Mm. Um, yeah. No, I think I think those are great examples, and you should. Those of you listening should be constantly thinking about those examples, so that whenever you're at a networking event, interviewing a, a recruiter, spontaneously contacts you, uh, you want to be able to say, you know, uh, I have these qualities. I can disseminate information, or right? I can talk about complex topics in, in simple, um, using simple simple words that clients can understand. I have good client facing skills, good customer service skills, good communication skills, um, as seen through all this work that I've done. You know, you may know, don't have to have two PhDs to be able to manage multiple things at once. You, most of you are managing multiple projects at once, um, you know, projects on top of projects and, and doing these things in uh, a very time organized fashion. So be thinking about all this stuff because they are really important, again, for this kind of cross-functional work. Uh, we did have a question in the chat box from v Vajendra. Said so you said you don't have much writing in this position, so what's the role basically? And I know that we've talked about <laughs> this already, but I, I do think it's it's kind of a sticking point. So we, whenever PhDs hear the word publications, automatically you think that you're going to be doing scientific editing, medical writing, whatever. So maybe you can take yeah, us through do. the workflow. <laughs> so maybe you can take us through the workflow and where you are at in the point of a workflow of you know a, a, a publication project that you're managing. So From conception each, to each... market or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not one publication. Like, yeah, you work – when you're a PhD student, you work this hard for one publication. Each manager manages over 100 publications mm. in many therapeutic areas So I ha and, and all over the world. So I have – this is the part where organization has to really kick in because you need to be on top of your deadlines and your – and when the posters are due. Um, so – Mm. Let's say that you let's, – let's say we're developing a manuscript. Um, and so what you do first, um, after you're working first with the – let's say we're working on a clinical paper. So you're working first with the clinical people and the stats people to see if they have all the data finished and uh, analyzed. Next, what we have to do is we actually have to approach key opinion leaders – um, especially ones that work in the clinical trial to see if they want to participate into the manuscript or the whole uh, project itself. So in this case, I also get to talk to a lot of um, uh, key opinion leaders like physicians. Um, mm -hmm. And after that's all done, we present the data to the key opinion leaders and get their ideas of what they want to do and where they want to go with this. Um, so. In this case, we would have a few clinical people, internal, allergen people, and we have would have a few uh, key opinion leaders in the field. For me, it would be dermatology that are on the paper. 
And next, I, I then send it to my writing agency. So it's actually an agency that writes for me. And they do the first draft outline. Um, and then we send it back to the key opinion leaders and, and internal authors. So this goes back and forth in the first draft, second draft, third draft, and all that stuff. Mm. Um, afterwards, when we are done, we have to make sure that it has a finished product. But before we submit it, and then I have to put it through a system where all the higher executives read the paper to make sure that it is medically correct and legally correct as well mm. and scientifically correct. And this so, is, I mean, all this, I have to use my science background to make sure all the messages are, are correct as well. Yeah, so just right there, I mean, like there was like 10 different departments she mentioned, right? All the way from legal to executive to field. I mean, the people that are go, going to those key opinion leaders, um, they're not just, you know, Julie might talk to them over the phone or maybe you go there in person occasionally, but the, there's also probably a sales team or liaisons or associates that are in the field working with these key opinion leaders. And the key opinion leader is just somebody essentially who uses the company's product and likes, or is somebody who's well known in the field that uses the company's product or will use the company's product for free, whatever, just to give them their opinion on it. Yeah. Um, yeah and that so, will help make these papers, these publications. Yeah. And I actually use MSLs to help me uh, if, if, if doctors are non-responsive to a couple of drafts, I would say, Hey, so and so, can you take make a visit to doctors, whoever, and make mm. sure that they read the draft? And so that's that's my close relationship to MSLs as well. Yeah, exactly. So uh, you, hopefully you can see where all these things are fitting fitting together. Yeah, lots of interpersonal work, lots of cross functional work. Um, I did want to break this down a little bit because we hear a lot of terms. We hear clinical papers, we hear white papers, we hear marketing papers. Maybe you can talk to us about the different types of publications and some of the, you know, you, you talked about the lingo or the nomen nomenclature that's used um, to describe them. Well, white papers, we don't, we don't ourselves publish them, but we receive them and we can probably use for an idea for a paper. So a white paper is an internal document where they use um, competitor, they, they have competitor data and there's con comparing and contrasting. Um, we also have um, the clinical data, so that's the primary data that we get through. But there is also a way we can also have a sub-analysis, so we, we look at the data in a different way. So that's a sub-analysis of the clinical data. In addition, there's reviews. And then also uh, we do preclinical data sometimes. You actually don't have to report all your preclinical data. That's not, if it, if it doesn't work out, you don't have to report it. But you do have to report all your, all your clinical data. And then lastly, we also have, um, not lastly, there's more. We also have post-marketing data from phase four studies. Um, mm -hmm. So this is from the medical affairs side. And we also can do, um, um, there's two ones two specific ones that we can give for um, physicians to do by themselves. One is called an IIT, which is Investigator Initiated Trial. Um, so where they work with the post-marketing team to do a trial themselves, and then we help publish that data. Thank you for joining us for another Industry Careers for PhDs podcast. If you're interested in attending one of these interviews live, or if you're interested in getting access to the full interview, including all of the background materials and show notes, go to cheekyscientist.com backslash association and learn how to become a associate. Um, you can get on the wait list for the next association enrollment period there and learn full details about the program. It's a program specifically designed to help PhDs transition uh, into top industry positions. If you would like to see receive more of these interview highlights uh, via our podcast uh, sent directly to your email, go to cheekyscientist.com and email subscribe under where it says start here. If you haven't already, you can also subscribe to this podcast on iTunes. Um, until next week, remember your value as a PhD and start thinking and acting like a successful industry professional.